Good evening, everybody. My name is Ignacio Ramirez. I'll be your moderator for this evening's session. And welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a, this is a class, and it's not a church. Okay. Okay. This is not a church or a religious organization. Oh, boy, I messed up. Start all over. Good evening, and welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a school, and it is not a church, and neither are we affiliated with a church or religious organization. This class is a nonprofit, non denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of the eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity unto this present day. Now, this class is a result of a divine panoramic vision and revelation given to Henry Clifford Kennelly in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. Since that time, they established schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. Archetype Pattern Workshop was established in February 2021. Now, in this class, we use and teach by the true and original name and titles for the Heavenly Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The word of Son is Elohim. It has also been improperly substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. We now know that each Lord must have a name, each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, He's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in His pure spirit state, on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. And this shape and form could only be seen in a divine vision and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, who the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title 
because we have by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. Now after Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth in this school to prove that everything in the universe moves and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now the ten ends of the school are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. And seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, or Satan, and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And the eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh, from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immoral glorification in the newer state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan, speak the truth. All right, this morning we have prayer by Dr. Uh, Eunice Reiser. Our scripture lesson is Isaiah, the 34th chapter. Our scripture reading will be Dr. Nanette Ramirez. And we have a selection of music after the prayer. Good evening, class. Let us bow our hearts and mind in a moment of prayer. Gracious Father Yahweh, thank you once again for allowing us to be here tonight. We know that it's only through your will that we are here, and we're thankful that you have brought us back again, that we can learn more about your purpose, your pattern, and your plan, and that you allow us the eye-openers to see that it is a reality in our life that you exist right within us. And I ask that you continue to open up our hearts and mind, that we humble ourselves and to learn the things that you have set before us in this last day. This and many other things, according to your will that we ask, all that you have given unto us, we want to thank you. So all these things and many others, we ask in thy son's name, Yahshua the Messiah, let us all say, hallelujah. Hallelujah.
My name is Nanette Ramirez, and I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name versions of the Old and New Testament, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trainer. I'll be reading Isaiah, the 34th chapter. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it, for the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations, and his fur fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, and the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of Yahweh is filled with blood, it is made fat with the fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of kidneys and, or, of rams for Yahweh hath a sacrifice in Bozrah 
and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea, and the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of Yahweh's vengeance, and the year of recompenses, for the controversy of Zion, and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the, the comorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles to proclaim the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all, is, all its princes shall be nothing. The, and thorns shall come up in her place, palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island, and the sat satire shall, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl, also shall rest there and find for herself a place to, of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow there shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Seek ye out of the book of Yahweh and read. Not one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. And he hath cast a lot for them, and ha his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever from generation to generation shall they dwell therein. I had read uh, chapter 34 of Isaiah. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. All righty now, thank you for that. Uh, let's begin tonight with a foundation, and it's good to be here, as I could say. Okay, uh, we come to this class to learn something, some truth, okay, that somebody had told us a while ago to get us started to come into understand, come into an understanding of Yahweh Elohim, okay, and his manifestations, but the thing about it is by this divine panoramic vision revelation given to Henry Clifford Kenley in the year 1931, we wouldn't know anything about Yahweh's purpose, okay? And the key to this knowledge and understanding of how the Bible is written, we just read in Isaiah, and it was mentioned that if you want to know what's going on today, you got to read the scriptures, you know? And we wouldn't understand it if we didn't have a pattern. That's the thing. The, the pattern is the key to understanding. Right. And that's what we're going to go over, a basic, you know, foundation. So we can uh, understand what's, being, what's been written and how it points to Yahshua the Messiah, not us, but it points to him. And that's how the devil deceived us in the world. We think that those scriptures point to us, that we should do something that's written down in those scriptures. That's why people walking around with condemned minds, killing themselves, jumping over bridges, doing things because they failed. They think they're failed, okay? But the, fail is, the failure is they don't know anything about Yahweh's purpose, okay? Now, this is a divine tabernacle pattern, first seen by Moses up in the mount. On the second trip he went up to this, he made three trips in this mount, Mount Sinai. On the second trip, Yahweh showed him, okay, a vision 
uh, the creation in six solar days, and on the seventh day he rested. Now for the next 33 days, he was up there 40 days and 40 nights, he showed him the construction of this tabernacle, how to construct it, what vessels to put in there. There's nine principal vessels. Okay, the reason why? Because there's nine principal attributes. You'll learn about that later on. Okay, but first, we have this particular illustration here, Moses laying on this rock, seeing a divine vision, and uh, you know, a vision, panoramic vision. You know, I like to say, uh, uh, you know, an unlimited view in every direction, okay? But he sees this in a vision. This is a, 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 um, intangible. In other words, it wasn't, uh, you can't touch it. But he saw it in his mind. Later on, he ha Yahweh had him build this tabernacle out here in the wilderness of Sinai to govern the people, govern the 12 tribes, okay? Now, as I said, there's seven steps in this, in this tabernacle pattern. Divine means from heaven, just like Moses saw it. Yahweh himself, just like the founder says, don't believe me because I said I had a panoramic vision in Revelation. But make me prove it to you beyond, satis beyond your satisfaction. Okay? And that's how we become, we come to have these classes. Because we do, we understand it's been proven to us that this man did receive a divine panoramic vision and a revelation. Okay? Now, we have this other plate here, okay, which is a, we call a migratory pattern. Okay? And they go, and it goes along with the pattern here of the tabernacle, okay? Uh, seven steps, okay? And we'll see the correlation between each step, okay? Each compartment of this tabernacle had three major vessels in there, okay? There's nine principal vessels. There was more things in there, but we just wanted to deal with the nine principal ones. Okay, the first step in this tabernacle is the gate, okay? The second step is this brazen altar of sin sacrifice with four horns in each corner, which the high priest took of the sacrifice, the blood of the sacrifice, and placed on each horn, okay? The third step is this brazen labor of water. There the high priest washed, the low priest, okay, and they also... Uh, uh, wash the sacrifice, okay? They had to immerse these sacrifice in the water to clean it off. Plus, they had to immerse themselves in water to wash, okay? Now, the third step, or the fourth step here is the door, or the first veil, okay? Which, uh, holy anointing oil, when, uh, when uh, uh, the cup of holy anointing oil was, okay? And the high priest, when he was uh, uh, um, anointed to, to uh, officiate in this, in the temple here, or in, in in the holy place, in the most holy place, or the sanctuary. That's the word I was looking for. Okay. Now, he had to stand at the door. Moses poured over the cup of holy anointing oil on the top of his head, dripped down his beard all the way down to his feet. Okay. The same with the other two. So he could officiate here in, in the sanctuary. Now, that's the fourth step. Okay, now the fifth step is the sanctuary or the holy place. Here you have the candlestick or the, the, the lampstand, seven branches, okay, which lit the holy, the holy place during the night and it was put, put out in the morning, okay. Uh, the next article is here is, is a golden table of shoe bread with golden crown around it and 12 loaves of bread. That's where the high priest would, would eat and the two low priests, okay? Twelve, signifying the twelve tribes of Israel. The next article here is a golden altar of incense. There would, they would burn uh, four uh, ingredients, uh, incense, which would make a sweet smelling savior unto Yahweh. In the cloud, I mean, it would symbolize a cloud, too, because the high priest on the Day of Atonement would go up in the most holy place. He'd put the clothes of the uh, of the uh, incense on in a censer, 
and swing it as he's in the holy place and he would make it like he's on a cloud, okay? That would be intercession here. So you have light, bread, intercession in the holy place, the fifth step. The sixth step is the second veil, okay? There is, uh, it had uh, these angelic figures embroidered in, inside and out, okay? And all through the most holy place, you know, all over the walls, everything, you had uh, angelic figures. There on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in there three times a day, uh, three times that day, okay? And on the, the third trip, he would put on the garments of beauty and glory and stand before the altar of Yahweh, okay, or the throne of Yahweh, which is this threefold configuration, but you had the two angelic figures here on the mercy seat. Looks like they're facing each other, but what they're doing, they're witnessing to the cloud between the cherubims here. So on the Day of Atonement, if the high priest did everything right, it would flash. And in this compartment here, it was dark. You couldn't see anything, okay? So he had to feel his way and make sure he stood between these staves you could read about and face the, the ark. He couldn't turn his back on it. He had to be flicking the blood seven times. And it was on the, uh, like a Lazy Susan type of deal. And he, he would walk around, do a figure eight, come this way, walk around, and come out on the other side. Okay? And there's three threefold configuration, like I said, there's two, uh, two angelic figures on the mercy seat. And he had the chest fair, which Yahweh told Moses to place the second set of stones that he went up there on the third trip to get. And uh, Aaron's rod that budded and a jar of manna from the wilderness that uh, the children of Israel ate from. Now, the correlation here is the gate is one over here that would uh, correlate with the door of the children of Israel or the entrance to the children of Israel's house, okay? Now, they would take the blood of the sacrifice, just like the blood here on the altar, and place it in four, point, four horns, now you had the lentil, two side posts, and then from the basin that they collected the blood in, they would strike it there. Okay, so you have your that's your your second uh, step there. Your third is they took a three day journey up to the Red Sea. Okay, and they followed this phenomenal uh, uh, which was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And they followed this cloud. Actually, it was Yahweh Elohim, okay, or the angel in that cloud that led them up to the Red Sea, okay? And there, it was parted. Uh, Yahweh Elohim told, or Yahshua told Moses to raise his rod, so the, the Red Sea opened up, okay, like a tunnel, and they went over on dry ground, okay? So that's the fourth step here, okay? Now the fifth step is they entered into the wilderness of Sinai, okay? There, Okay, they murmured for food. Well, Yahweh gave them food. He gave them manna from heaven. Okay, six days to collect it. On the seventh day, there wouldn't be any. So on the sixth day, they're supp supposed to collect twice as much to hold them over for the next set of days. Now, that was your, your, your bread. Now the light, a little out of order there. The light is that cloud that led them that cloud went and sat upon Mount Sinai. And at night it would be a big pillar of fire which lit up the wilderness so the children of Israel would be in light all the time. And during the day, it would transform into cloud or transmute, or better say, it would transmute into a cloud. But they always were in light. So you have your light, your bread. And when they had problems, they would go to Moses. And Moses or the people had a problem with Moses, he would go to this tent and talk to Joshua, or Yahshua, okay, or Yahweh Elohim, or better, and he would talk with him, okay, and that was the intercession. So you have light, the cloud, bread, manna, and intercession, okay, with Yahweh Elohim, or Yahshua. Now the sixth step here is the Jordan River, Okay, just like the, the, the second veil. 
you know, and when we went over, it was the high priest and the, and the Ark of the Covenant. It was time to go into and possess the land of uh, Canaan. Okay, you can read about that also there. Now, as soon as the high priest was bearing the Ark, touched the brim of the water, the Jordan River, it tunneled up, it opened up, and it went on through. Okay, and they entered into the promised land, or Canaan's land. And that is the seventh step, just like the most holy place here is the seventh step. Now, they had this three-in-one configuration also that was made of pure gold or, or overlaid with pure gold, just like this Ark of the Covenant here, the angelic figures. There was a porch, a porch, a sanctuary, an oracle, Okay was overlaid with precious gold still. There's just two chapters, Boaz and what's the other one? Joaquin. Joaquin, okay. Now, the, the founder of this teaching said that it looked like a man sitting on a throne. And there's a verse in Isaiah also said, you know, Yahweh, um, let's get it, uh, what is it, uh, Isaiah 24. It says, the earth is my throne. Uh, I mean, the uh, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Isaiah 66 and 1. Isaiah 66 and 1. Thus saith Yahweh, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Okay. Where is the house that ye built unto me? Okay, that's good. And just to show that when the founder said things, and we relate what he says, you know, because other people that were with him, it's like Bud there, and he would say these things, and we could say it because he said it, and we have verses to prove it. This is the heaven, okay? Heaven is my my throne, and the earth is my footstool, just like you have it here on this chart here, in the beginning of Moses' vision, okay? Right there, seventy elders saw it. Aaron and Adam in the bayou, okay? So there's witnesses. And there you have your seven steps, okay? And once you get to know these, once they're in, uh, kind of seared in your mind, you know, you can start looking at things, uh, uh, scriptures, and see how they go by this pattern, okay? You can look for these uh, 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 principles, okay? The blood, the sacrifice, uh, Death, water, immersion, okay, spirit, 40, 40 weeks to build this tabernacle. They spent 40 years in the wilderness, you know. All these things you could pick up and see how, Yah how it all points to Yahshua the Messiah. And that's what we do in this, in, in, in this uh, workshop, okay, is to pick up the things that we've been looking over and not understanding and break it down so we can get an understanding, okay? Now, I'm going to call the next speaker. It would be Dr. Will Williams, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll get something out of it, you know. Good evening, class. <coughs> it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be here with you to learn more of this great and awesome, colossal, stupendous panoramic vision and revelation given to us by Yahweh, our Elohim, who is the resurrected Yahshua, the Messiah. And I appreciate the foundation the first speaker laid out for us. And this is Tuesday night, and as I always like to say, actually, this is workshop, of which the organization was named after. But on Tuesdays, I like to, as I like to say, get into the nuts and bolts of things, okay? I didn't have any particular subject to go into, but then I never do. I just let the charts do it for me, because this vision can speak for itself. I'm just the dummy, you know, like a ventriloquist. You know, he's got a dummy. 
you know, and he's, you know, he's, you know, the dummy is talking, but it's his, but it's the ventriloquist voice. Well, it's Yahweh talking, you know, but, I, but he's just using this dummy here to, to convey. You know. Say that again. But, yeah, okay. But you let go. That's in Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm open. Uh, well, okay, let me say this. In the times past, okay, as I said Sunday, we would go through our winter series of lectures, and this is when Joe Williams was alive. And what he used to like to do in, in the month of April, he liked to concentrate on the mystery of iniquity. That's, that's what he used to do. So we can still con continue with that tradition, so to speak. Or if you have any other suggestions or questions or anything like that, this is, this, you feel free to, to render them wherever you may be. Um, speak up. Somebody got a... You got some over there? We need a microphone because it used to be. Okay, well, it's a, it's a broad subject, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, just grab that mic there, turn it on. Because it's, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot, but as w anyway. Is it open? It is. There, there, we heard it. Uh, okay. Right. Hello. Ooh. Yeah. All right. I have my own question. So it's I don't really know how to word it, but what happened to your state of conscious like when you pass, like when your spirit moves on? Oh yeah. Like mm. right mm. now, I'm still in like the beginning stages of like what I know from class. I know the name. I know some of the pattern. How much is that just goes with me? Like, do I just you know, I'm overly aware of Yahweh and all things when I take off the flesh and mm. go into okay. heaven. Mm. Okay, that's, that's, that's a fair question, I think. <laughs> Basically, she's asking is, what happens to you when you die? <laughs> <laughs> That's really what it is. But what is the process? And it's so interesting because I just recently was watching uh, this documentary about near near death experiences and stuff. And I've always been curious about it, especially when you know because when I was younger as a teenager, I used to do hypnosis and astral projection and all. And that's kind of related to that. And people would see these things, you know, near death experiences. You know, and they would see well. The way a lot of stories go is like they see a, a light at the end of the tunnel or they may see their relatives who are dead and they go on and then, then this light tells them, you know, you must go back or something or, or they identify this light as God, you know, or this light tells them I'm this, that, and the other. But, you know, I've read a lot of the stories, but here's one thing I noticed in, in all of them. When they say that this being of light, this God, you know, never tells them that they're Yahweh, that he's Yahweh. You know, I have never read an account where this being of light, where they talk to people and say, well, I am Yahweh. I've, I've never seen that. You know, they tell them, you know, I'm God, I'm Allah, I'm Buddha, I'm Jehovah. Uh, one story I read said that this being of light told this person, whoever you want me to be, I can be that. <laughs> I read that. So I was like, so it makes me wonder sometimes, you know, what is it that they're really experiencing? Now, the only testimony that I feel that, that is probably credible that I know of is the, cre is the testimony given by Richard Davis. If you know who Richard Davis was, he was a guy that, uh, in, I think in 1974, he was in a really horrific motorcycle accident, right? And, and literally, he, uh, he died. And, doc and, 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 he, and, in this, and if you've ever, and I got his testimony, uh, you know, you can go online on our site and look up Richard Day and you can listen to his testimony. And for what he described, he said that he was in this state of peace. You know, it was like he was in the cloud. You know, like the cloud here. He was, he was just in a state of peace. All right? And then he found himself being brought back to his body and he was racked up and he was in the hospital. And Dr. Kidley is standing at, his, at the foot of the bed. And for what I understand, he said, he asked Dr. Kidley, he said, he said, boss, he said, I was in a good place. Why did you bring me back? And Dr. Kidley supposedly said to him, I needed a witness. I needed a witness. So 
I would suggest to you to listen to Richard Davis's testimony. It's on it's on archetype pattern, uh, not not workshop, but the orig ar the original archetype pattern. You know, no, no, yeah. Oh, is it? No, it's on, no, it's on mine. Workshop, yeah, I think. I'm I th I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's on mine because I think I did that. Yeah, yeah, because we, we had left, I had left by then, you know, <coughs> yeah, I had left, so yeah, it's on workshop, okay, yeah, Richard Davis, because what happened was, I remember I had, uh, I had been contacted by his widow, and, uh, well, the audio had already been made, the, the audio was years old, but what I did was she sent me some pictures of him, you know, and her, you know, and I assembled them, I edited it together along with his audio uh, testimony. So now you can see, uh, you know, like the pictures appear like, well, yeah, like what, yeah. You know, and I added some music to it and all. It was something I, I produced just to give it a little, you know, three dimension to it, I guess. Because yeah, it was just straight audio. So I just, she was kind enough to send me the pictures, photographs of him and stuff. So I was able to set them in various intervals while he was, you know, going through his testimony. But to go back to what she originally said about what happens when you die? You know, what is the process, okay? Well, first you have to find out what is the beginning of everything, which is Yahweh, who is spirit, all right? And spirit is the source and substance, the limits and bounds of everything that exists, all right? Everything that you can conceive or whatever comes from pure spirit. Now, there are two manifestations of, of spirit. You have the incorporeal manifestation, all right, which is Elohim taking on shape and form or transmuting in part into this state, these attributes coming together and making this super incorporeal man, or as Dr. Kenley termed it, this great heavenly anthropomorphic being. You know, that's a nice fancy word, but it just simply means to have shape and form of a man without fleshly counterparts. Okay, known as the Word or the Son. And then this Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, all right? See, now this is spirit materialized as representation of that. Um, and it's even in the textbook like that. See, because you have pure spirit and you have two manifestations. You have, this is, would be representative of the angelic creation. Actually, he had, we had the scripture just read about... Uh, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. All right, so now this is representative of the 92nd atom or the hydrogen atom. All right, this is the word made, this is the word. And then this is the word made flesh. So you have two manifestations of the same spirit. Also, it was going through this migratory pattern. This migratory pattern represents the greater and more perfect sanctuary, which is the universe. Egypt would be like the, which is the court roundabout, that would be like the physical creation. The wilderness of Sinai would be like the holy place. That would be like the angelic creation or the incorporeal creation. Canaan's land would be the most holy place. This is where spirit law is, okay? Spirit law controls these two aspects of the universe. This is what the universe consists of, a physical creation, and an incorporeal creation, okay? You can even say, you can talk about the heavens. You know, first heaven, which is space. The earth hangs like a ball in space. The second heaven is the atmospheric heaven. All right, birds fly through it and, and planes and all that, and rain comes down from it. The second heaven, atmospheric heaven. The third heaven is neither geographical or physical. The first two heavens emanate from the third which is spirit law, or eternity, okay? Now, boy, I don't want to do this, because a man, let's, let's, let's get that scripture. Um, I think it's, where is it at? I want to say Timothy, but it talks about about your body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. 
First Thessalonians 5.23. First Thessalonians 5 and 23. And the very Elohim of peace sanctify you wholly, mm -hmm. so that your whole spirit mm -hmm. and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Your spirit, soul, and body. Okay. Now, this, uh, um, place six and seven. No, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry, not that. I, I meant uh, the 60 day. I <laughs> played, pl played 11 and 12. I'm sorry. I'm getting, yeah, I know. I know. All right. Let's read this. Uh, uh, I'll put this here. All right. Now. All right, here we have the sixth day. This is the makeup of the man. All right, uh, maybe we should read that so that we know what exactly what we're, um, what we're working with here. Uh, Genesis, let's go with uh, uh, let's see here. Well, first let's read um, Let's just read this, the whole sixth day. That's, uh, for, that's Genesis 124. I have a Schofield, so I, will, I, I think it should be the same in the holy name. Genesis 1 and 24. Mm -hmm. And Elohim said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, mm -hmm. cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after their kind, mm -hmm. and it was so. Mm -hmm. And Elohim made the beast of the earth after their kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the ground after their kind. Mm -hmm. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Mm -hmm. So Elohim created man in his image. In the image of Elohim created he him. Male and female created he him. And Elohim blessed him, and Elohim said unto him, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And Elohim said, Behold, I had have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you it shall be for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to every creeping thing upon the earth where wherein there is life I have given every green herb for food and it was so and Elohim saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All right. Now, let's pause for a moment. Now, let's backtrack here. The first speaker talked about how Moses went up the mountain, one of his trips up, up into the mountain, okay? The second trip, specifically, all right? Where Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, 70 elders of Israel, they saw this, Elohim, all right? Let's read Exodus 24 and 16. I'm just going to, I'm just expediting this, but there's a point that I need to make here. Exodus 24 and 16. Uh-huh. And the glory of Yahweh abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And right, the seventh hold it right there now. Usually there's a colon or a semicolon after that, colon. after six days, right? See, which means Moses was, was taken back. See, up here in this cloud, he sees the six days of creation. We just read part of that in, in the first chapter of Genesis, okay? Now, that's what he saw, and that's what he recorded because <clears throat> he saw that, okay, he saw that, and that's, and so when he, okay, keep reading. 
from six, you know, 16, where you left off six days. Um, Hello. In Genesis. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, no, we're in Exodus. You were reading Exodus 24, 16, okay. right? Okay, yes. And the glory of Yahweh abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, okay, now colon. That, uh, okay, now, as I said, the sixth day, we read that in the first chapter of Genesis, okay? All right, now keep reading. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now when he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud, that would correspond with the seventh day as it is written in Genesis. Okay? Now, when Moses, and it was also at the same time he saw the inner works of this tabernacle pattern. Seven days he saw the creation. Thirty-three days he saw the pattern. That's 40 days he's up in the mount. Mm -hmm. All right. He comes back down the mount. And so, because, see, these folks here, they're not waiting for him after 40 days. Because, see, this is a firing inferno. This is earthquakes. This is uh, thick darkness around it. There was thunder and lightning. Right? And, they, and they saw Moses go up into this fiery inferno. And they just, after, a week, after several days, they just said, well, you know, that's it for Moses. Yep. And then especially after 40 days, they just said, well, you know, that, that's it. They just came on back down. So when Moses and Joshua come back down, all right, they deal with they hear no you know, noise of war and they deal with the golden calf. But at the same time, they went and talked to the seventy elders. At least Moses did, because they asked Moses, Moses, you were up there for forty days, what happened? Mm -hmm. All right. So then he just goes off and said, Well, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. See, as it reads in Genesis, okay? And, and Moses is telling them that, and look, these folks are writing it down, okay? They're writing it down as Moses is telling it. In the meanwhile, Joshua is off to the side. Joshua the son of Nun, because he's the one that took, them, he took Moses up here in the first place and transfigured before him. And it took him through the days of creation. He's, Joshua is listening to Moses telling the 70 elders what's happening as according to the first chapter of Genesis. And Joshua notices, oh, you've left a couple of things out. But that's okay because I know I'm going to bring you back up here and I'm going to refresh your memory. I'm going to bring it back to your remembrance. That's why when we go over to Genesis, the second chapter, let's read that. Genesis 2 and 1. Yes. These are the origins of the heavens and of the earth mm -hmm. when they were created in the day that Yahweh Elohim made the earth now, and the heavens. Now, see, now we said Moses, is, 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 he laid down here and he's shown this vision in six solar days. In other words, it took him a solar day to see each process of each, what's happening on each day. All right. So he sees that, okay. But in reality, it's created in the day right. of eternity, all right? The day of Yahweh, but continue. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, mm -hmm. and every herb of the field before it grew. Mm -hmm. For Yahweh Elohim had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Now, see, now Moses didn't mention that in the first trip, but here's Joshua. Because, see, now, the second trip here is when Moses is coming back up. Put your finger there and read Exodus 34 and 1. Exodus 34 and 1. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. Mm -hmm. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. Mm -hmm. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flock nor herd feed before that mount. Okay, good enough for the moment. Okay, so Mo this is the beginning of this is Moses' third trip, because when he saw the first the previous trip when he brought down the original tables of stone, he broke them because of the golden calf, right? So he had to hew out his own set of stones. And when he comes back up here, look, the first set of stones was cut out of the mountain. So his tables of stone had to, go, had to be imprinted back into the indented part of the mountain. And it had to fit. Right. And Elohim would write on them, okay? 
But my point is, this is the mo this is the third trip. This is corresponding with the second chapter of Genesis. See, because now, ja oh, let's, let's let's bring that in there. Exodus 33 and 8. I need to bring this in since, since I'm here like this, because because a lot of people don't. At least I don't hear people bring it up, but this is a, a critical part of the story. And I haven't forgotten your question. I'm just laying the groundwork, all right, to, to get to where we want to be. Somebody. Exodus 33 and 8. Uh-huh. And it came to pass when Moses went out into the meeting tent that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door mm -hmm. and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the meeting tent, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the meeting tent. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the meeting tent door. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Mm -hmm. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the meeting tent. All right. So Joshua did not depart. So when we read Moses going up the third time, he's going up alone. Joshua did not go with him this time. But yet, here's Elohim here appearing before Moses in a vision again. How did that happen? Well, Joshua, the son of Nun, who did not leave the meeting tent, he is astral projecting into the cloud on Moses' third trip so that he could see him, okay? And he's going and he's showing him a recapitulation of the vision. That's why I always go to the 40-plate chart because the 40-plate chart is the illustration of what Moses saw in the recapitulation on the third trip, mm -hmm. okay? All right? Now, let's go back. I had to bring that in. Now let's go back to Genesis because, see, Joshua now, is reminding Moses of the of certain things in the second chapter that he showed him, but didn't mention it when he was talking to the seventy elders. All right, one of the things was like about how you know the water system came. You know, there was no rain. Was like, yeah, go back to where you where you left off in Genesis. Genesis second two chapter. and two. Uh huh. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. Colon. For Yahweh Elohim had not caused it to rain upon the earth, mm -hmm. and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. See, now, see, Moses didn't mention that in the first chapter, but Joshua here is bringing it back to his remembrance. Mm -hmm. That's why Moses is writing. I mean, he comes back, and he's going to tell these folks again, and he's going to say, well, you know, this is how the earth, you know, was watered. No, see, he didn't right. say that the first. So, but he's right. gonna he's gonna come back and you know because Joshua's he's reminding yeah. him and say, well, look, you know, here's some particulars that you forgot to mention. Mm -hmm. Okay, but go ahead. Two and four, and Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust of the ground. All right, here we are. This now we're getting something somewhere. Come on. And br and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, mm -hmm. and man became a living soul. And man became a living soul. Okay, I want the theosophy play. All right. Um, I'll bring them both up. The anthropomorphic man, yeah. yeah. I feel like Joe Williams right now. <laughs> Okay, uh, continue reading. Two and five. And Yahweh Elohim <coughs> planted a garden eastward in Eden, mm -hmm. and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made Yahweh Elohim to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, mm -hmm. the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to the water to water the garden, mm -hmm. and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Uh, actually, we have the we have it here on the map, and I have a documentary I have somewhere in my stores. I can't find it. 
but this is where Dr. Kinley put it at right here. Prior to the continents looking the way they are, see, in the antediluvian age, there was just all one land mass right. at the time. It was just one, one land mass. And so that's why it's possible for four rivers to be coming up out of here. All right. Two of the rivers, we, we we'll keep reading, we'll show you. The name of the first is Pison. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, mm -hmm. where there is gold. Mm -hmm. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedulium and Onyx stone. And the name of the second river is um, Gion. What is it? Gion. Or oh, Gion. Gihon. Gihon. The name is it that compasseth the whole land of Cush. Cush, that's, that's over here in Africa. <laughs> yeah, that's down here. And the name of the third river is Hidikel. Hidikel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. The, mm -hmm. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Euphrates. Now, that we still have that river today. The, the one she just mentioned previously that I believe that would be the ancient name for the Tigris River. Because mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. you have the Tigris River and the Euphrates River here. And see, Mesopotamia was called the, the cradle of civilization. Well, the first civilization, you know, of the Chaldeans, you know, came up and, and things that they developed, you know, this started here. Between the two rivers. That's, that's what the word Mesopotamia means, the land between the two rivers, because it was fertile. See, they would get silt coming from, good silt coming down from the mountains, you know, on, on the rivers, and, and it was just wonderful for growing. You know, and, and the Babylonians, or, the, or the rather the early Chaldeans, who were the forerunners of the Babylonians, they, they had a lot of it. They invented writing, mathematics, beer, <laughs> you know, stuff like that, that we still use to this day, you know, because it was part of these kingdoms that have come down, okay? But keep reading. And Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to mm. dress it and mm. to keep it. Now, he, here he is here. He's made, first, he's a hunk of dirt. No, he's lifeless. Then now he is immersed in the breath of life, meaning that Elohim breathed into him. And, and, and it's not like a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation type thing. He just simply stepped into yeah. the man, and, and he just breathed, he breathed into him. See, and that would be like, see, there's a death. He's, you know, because before that, he's, he's dead. He's lifeless. Now he's immersed. Now the spirit is animating him. Right. See, now there's a division between body and soul. See, now he's filled with a soul. And now and also there's a division between soul and spirit because this is the spirit which animated the soul, which created the body. So technically, your body and your soul emanate from the spirit that is within, see? Because it's the spirit that brought this together. Look, I have these up here for a reason. It's showing you the attributes here. This is theosophy. These are the divine attributes of Elohim. This is this heart. It's shaped like a heart. The same heart is the same heart here in the cloud, see? That represents what Elohim, is, what, what Yahweh is, what, or really what Elohim is. Yahweh is spirit law altogether, but also this heart is the same as Elohim. What we're looking at here is an exposition of what the heart looks like, right? Which is, a, which is intelligence flanked by wisdom and knowledge. See, this is the way Dr. Ken explained it. I'll come over here. Here's Elohim coming through the veils. Coming out of the clouds, so to be, or coming from abstract, coming from inscrutability and incomprehensibility. Here's intelligent comes first, all right, flanked by wisdom and knowledge. This is the crown. Together, wisdom and knowledge and intelligence makes a triad in the way it makes it what is called supreme crown. These attributes then give birth to the next set of attributes, which is beauty flanked by love and justice, another triad. This set of attributes gives birth to the next set of attributes, which is foundation, flanked by power and strength. See, another triad. And all of these nine attributes are enveloped in the tenth attribute, which is the kingdom. 
All right? Now we come over here, and we have kingdom here, and we have a scripture here. We, could, we, should, we probably should read Matthew 25, 34. See, now the reason why I'm doing this, because see here, the man, this is before the breath of life has enveloped him. He's just a hunk of clay. He's in a death-like state. He's just dead. And if you draw a line, especially like to here, see, you see no attributes here. All the attributes are in the most holy place and the holy place. There's nothing here. All right? Why? Because it's showing you that the flesh has zero value. Okay? Can we have that scripture? Matthew 25, 34. Mm -hmm. Then shall the kingdom say unto them on his right... Oh, sorry. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, mm -hmm. inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Okay, this is the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, see? Even before this came forth, it, here's the kingdom here. Yeah. Already in, in, in Yahweh's, you know, before anything comes forth. That's right. See? Because yeah. the way Dr. Kinley explained it like this, mm. Yahweh is not changing into anything. He's not changing. I mean, we do use words like, well, he transmuted right. into this, which is nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Which is a, it's a very proper word. But he's not, ch he's not changing into the sun, moon, and stars. He's not doing that. For the simple reason that in the abstract state, he's already there. He's the all in all. You just can't perceive it. Right. Yeah. It's just that simple. You can't perceive it. So therefore, he had to move into a state of perceivability. That's what this is. And right. we say it all the time. It can be seen in visions and revelations. That's right. It can be perceived that way. Okay? Now, here's the man, Adam. And the way Dr. Kinley explained it, he said that the man, Adam, was created a photostatic copy of this one. All right? And we say, and we get into it at times when we talk about the tabernacle. And the, this chart here, how the, how the systems of the man is reflective of the systems in the tabernacle and the attributes. See, when we say this, that matter is spirit materialized, what we mean is this. For example, like the man here. See, you, you, the man is made up of nine systems, right? Why? To reflect the nine attributes. And more to the point, they are the attributes manifested in part, not in totality. For example, the nervous system is intelligence. It's not a type of intelligence. It is it's intelligence, intelligence manifested in, in part in the flesh. Mm -hmm. As all the other systems are, they are the attributes. They this are. universe... <laughs> That's are right. the attributes manifested That's in right. part, That's not in totality, but they, but it is Yahweh, and is controlled with unerring accuracy by spirit law. Okay? Now, the man was made a photostatic copy of this one. So now here we got his body. All right? Now he has the breath of life in him. Now there's a division between body and soul. Okay? And now also here, there's a division between soul and spirit. See, the spirit law that operates this. All right? Mm -hmm. Keep going with the scriptures where Genesis, we have Genesis. Yes. Genesis 2 and 13. Uh-huh. And Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely mm -hmm. eat, mm -hmm. but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of mm -hmm. it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die the death. And Yahweh Elohim said, It is not good that man should be alone. Mm -hmm. I will make a suitable, um, I'll make a help suitable for him. And out of the ground, Yahweh Elohim formed every beast of the field mm -hmm. and every bird of the heavens and brought them unto the man to mm -hmm. see what he would call them. Mm -hmm. And whatsoever the man called every living creature that was its name. And the man gave names to all the all cattle and to the birds of the heavens and to all beasts of the field. All right. Now, why did you do that? Well, see, because he's the, it was, we read in the other scripture that he was given dominion and authority. 
Okay, so now all the beasts is brought to him. And look, and it's not just one, one you know, representative. We, we got two. Right. See, the male and the female of whatever the species that Yahweh brought to him. If he bought a horse, he brought two horses, the male and female. Why? Because they would represent the king and the queen of their species simply because they're the first ones. And so he's naming them. You know, he's naming them a horse, dog, cat, chicken, giraffe, zebra, monkey, elephant. You know, he's just naming them all. Okay? Now, for him to be naming and they're the king and queen of their species, and the reason why he can name them off because he's the king of kings. He's the king of kings. All right? The first speaker mentioned Solomon's temple up here. See, let's just draw a line here. We're up here because it's a heaven line. Let's just draw a line. Here's Solomon's temple here. And it was told that there was a porch, a sanctuary, and an oracle. Now, we can break it down some more because the porch was threefold. There was a court for the priest. There was a court for the Jews. And there was a court for the Gentiles. And see, and here's the thing that a lot of people get befuddled by because they read about Solomon, that he, had, he was married. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, you know. You know, he was, he, he was the forerunner of Wilt Chamberlain, right? But, and so, and so the question, and people question, well, how could he, you know, did he have that kind of stamina to, you know, I mean, like, you know, once a week or whatever? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But for the most part, these marriages were political marriages, okay? For example, uh, one of his wives, uh, he married, one of his wives was from Egypt. All right, and she was uh, the sister of the Pharaoh of Egypt, all right, because all of the wives he, he, he married were, were royalty. They were kings of something. So if he's got 700 wives, he's got 700 brother-in-laws who are kings, okay? So now he said, okay, we're, you know, you and I are tied by marriage, all right? You, we, we family, <laughs> basically, yeah, you know, we, we, we in-laws, but we family. You come to my aid in the time of need, I will come to your aid in time of need. However, th there's one thing you have to do. You and your family, at least once a year, you must come to the temple and give alms unto Yahweh. All right? That was, that was something he told them. He said, okay, well, I'll marry your sister, and I'll, but this is what you got to do. So they would all come, and they would be in the court of the Gentiles. Those 700 brother-in-laws or kings, and they would be there with their wives. And Solomon would come out on the veranda, and he would see them, and he would point them out and say, "Oh, I know you. You're my, you're all you're my brother-in-laws. You're, you're the king of Egypt. You know, you're the king of Bashan. You're the king of Iran. You're the king of Arabia. You're the king of Crete. You're the king of Cyprus." He's calling them out, just like Adam's calling out the beast. He said, "Yeah, you're the king of this. You're the king of that. <laughs> Why? Because Solomon is representing king of kings." See, yeah. he's calling them out by, you know, how we used to say back in the name, you know, when somebody get mad at you, don't make, they say, look, don't make me call you out by your natural name now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> remember we used to say yeah. that? We used to say that, yeah. you know, that's what, that's what he did. Adam called them out. He called, them, he called those beasts out by their natural name, and that's what Solomon did. He called them out by their that's natural right. names. <laughs> see, calling them out by names. Why? Because, see, down here on Pentecost, see, here you got Joshua here. He, he's the king of kings, and on the day of Pentecost, he's calling these, these beasts out by name and, trans, and translating them. He's called Peter, James, John. He's calling them all out by name. Seven years later to the Gentile, he's calling them out by name. Even to this day, he's calling you out by That's name. Right. <laughs> king of kings, why? He's calling you, you know. It's the same thing. Okay? Let's go back to Genesis. But for the man, there was not found a help suitable for him. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. All right, here we are, right here. Go ahead. And he slept, and, the, and he took the rib and wound and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib and the womb, which Yahweh Elohim had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. 
Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Okay. So now this is how the human race gets started here. We got the man here. He's in a deep sleep and he's under a spiritual immersion and here's the spirit making an incision. And here man he takes out the rib and the womb. And see, this is the division of the sexes. The word sex means to divide. That's what it means. And so now he brings to Adam who wakes up a womb man. And now here we have the unity of the masculine and feminine sexes. See, that's why he's saying, well, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, etc. Okay? Now, okay, now, going back to this, the man Adam is a body, soul, and spirit. Uh, maybe I need to bring this in. Plate 14. All right. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. We will find a plank for you suitable. <laughs> That's what Dr. Kinley used to say, didn't he? But give people a plank, give them something to do. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. did, he did say that, didn't he? I remember. Okay. Um, yeah, this. <coughs> All right, now here's, this is uh, angelic transgression. Let's, let's deal with the incorporeal for a minute. Now here we have Mike, uh, Lucifer up here, the angelic creation. All right, and there, and, and at, at one point, it was, it's, everything's okay, but then he rose up and he drew one third of an innumerable host with him. I haven't even think that he was their savior, just to put it shortly. And so there was, and so this caused a war in heaven. And Michael and his angel cast them out, all right? Now these are incorporeal beings, okay? Now they come through this veil here called angelic invisibility. It simply means you just can't see them. But now once they come through this veil, and see when you come through a veil, it represents a transition. There has to be a transition of some sort, okay? All right, so here they're transitioning from angelic invisibility and now they're in the holy place. Now they can be seen in a vision. They can appear to you in a vision, just like, uh, let's see, well, like right here. Here he is appearing to Eve in a vision. Angelic visibility, okay? All right, now, but because they were placed, a mark was placed on them, when they come out here, now they're coming through another veil because they're cast out. See, so now they're going through another division between invisibility and visibility. And now they're cast out. They are immersed in ethereal darkness around the, un the unformed earth, all right? Going to and fro, seeking whom they may devour, which is flesh, because now they got the mark on them, 666. Maybe you can confirm this, bud. But I remember hearing Dr. Kelly in a lecture do something, and I didn't see it visually because it was on audio, but I could see it in my mind, what he did, all right? And, I, and he did this. Okay. Now Satan, as we said, was in the most holy place. He was cast out of heaven, all right? All right, he's cast out. But he keeps trying to come back up. But there's a veil here that will not allow him back in there. And so he is rebuffed back down. <laughs> See that now? That's his mark. See? He's going See, that's why he's down here in the court roundabout and in the holy place, so-called, because he's also, the scripture says that he's the prince of the air. What did we say the atmosphere was at? That's in the whole, see? So he can, he can occupy this. He can even occupy this, but he cannot come back up here. Right. See? Okay. All right. That's why Joe used to say. Speak, speak in the microphone. That's why Joe used to say, you know, Satan is not sitting on your throne. That's right. It never, never, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. It is impossible for him to right. do that. 
How's he, how's he going to dislodge Yahweh? Yeah. You know? Yeah. See, but we're going to explain that, see, because they were women. So, because, see, these folks here, well, let's, let's read. Uh, third chapter. Yeah. Third, uh, uh. Uh, three and uh, what time is it? Oh, start with. Uh, I'll start with eight. Start with eight because they had, they had just did the transgression up here. You know, where Eve. You know, see here's Adam. Adam is looking at he's he's looking at her. He doesn't see him. He, she she sees him, but Adam is looking at her, looking at the tree. All right, and so she gets it, and so he deceives her, and he, she takes the fruit, and she gives it to her husband. And their eyes are open, and they realize they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together. Now we're starting on verse 8. Genesis 3 and 8. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim as they were walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Mm -hmm. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh Elohim amongst the trees of the garden. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh Elohim called unto the man and said unto him, There art thou, uh, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Mm -hmm. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. See, now the seed of the woman is Yahshua the Messiah. See, and we have it illustrated. He shall bruise his head, and he shall bruise his heel. See, Okay, go ahead. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy pain mm -hmm. and thy conception. Mm -hmm. In the pain thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, mm -hmm. and he shall rule over thee. Okay, good enough. Now, it was told to Satan that thus shall he eat all the days of thy life. That is to say, incarnate in the flesh. That's probably a better right here. Because see, we got the serpent here. And now we got the serpent coming out. And the first one, he incarnates as Cain. Cain is a product of the intercourse that Eve had with Lucifer spiritually. <laughs> All right. Physically, Cain is the son of Adam. Physically. You know, I mean, if you did a DNA test, you know, yeah. like on the Maury show, he would say, yeah. Adam, you, you know, when it comes to Cain, the paternity of Cain, you are the father. You know, I mean, from a biological point of view. But spiritually, he was the offspring of the intercourse between Lucifer and Eve, okay? The first one who was incarnated. And then after that, the rest of the human race. That's represented by this serpent or Leviathan, yeah. all right? That's why these empires come up out, out of this, all right? Now, <coughs> we've said that you're made of body, soul, and spirit, okay? Now, Dr. Kinley did a lecture many years ago and where people was kind of, I don't know, well I, well, I guess they were confused, otherwise he wouldn't have had to do the lecture. Where, you know, people used to say, well, sometimes, you know, it's like sometimes I feel, you know, righteous and then sometimes I feel like a demon, you know, that kind of thing. Or in other words, I, you know, one day I may be operating by one spirit, the next day I'm operating by another spirit, you know. And Dr. Kinley tried to explain and said, look, there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit operating you and the devil operating you at the same time. It just doesn't work like that, see. However, you do need to have the pattern and understanding the, the steps of the pattern, the process, the, high, the, the priest's the, you know, uh, uh, priest job, 
you know, the, the priest's job and everything to understand how this process is working, you know, in everyday life. Now, you're threefold just like this pattern. All right, <clears throat> let's get the textbook. I want, I want the textbook right quick. How much time I got? I think I can do this. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, actually, I had some tea over there. I forgot to bring, but it's probably cold now. But uh, all right, thank you. Ooh. Warm enough. <laughs> okay, I, uh, I want the textbook. I want the. Let's see. I want the. I believe it's the third day of creation. All right, uh, the, what I want is, uh, it's on page 62. Volume one, I'm sorry, volume one. Pa volume one, page 62. Volume one, page 62. Okay, I want you to read the, the third paragraph there. It says the second veil. Third paragraph. The second veil, plate 1B, uh -huh. dividing the holy place from the ho most holy place, mm -hmm. symbolizes the bud concealing and thereafter revealing the division between blossom and f fruition. <coughs> Maybe I'll uh, since I'm talking about it. The third day plate, plate four. So that you can see exactly. That's what that's why Dr. Kimley illustrated this. So you could your eyes are the highest plate plate uh no 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 yeah, no no third day. Third day. day. Th third day, I'm sorry. Did I say plate four? Yeah, I'm, I know. I'm getting I get mixed up in there. That's the one I want. Yes, because we're reading the third day. That's exactly what I want. All right. Thank you much. All right. Let's read that second, uh, that um, third paragraph again. Page 62, volume 1, third paragraph. Mm -hmm. The second veil, plate 1B, dividing the holy place from the most holy place, symbolizes the bud concealing and thereafter revealing the division between blossom and fruition. Mm -hmm. Plate 8B. The blossoms on the same veil compares to the angelic figures woven on the second veil in the pattern of the tabernacle. Plate 1B and the entrance through, the re through or removal of the veil of the flesh of the Messiah. Plate mm -hmm. 31B. Who arose a quickening spirit. This is proven by the rending of the veil in the temple as evidence being a figure of his body. Okay, this, I, either I didn't hear it, uh, okay, read the, read the first line again. The second veil, plate 1B, dividing the holy place from the most holy place symbolizes the bud concealing and thereafter revealing the division between blossom and fruition. All right. That's what I wanted to get. Can you put it on the board? Because I want to show something here. Because the point is the concealing and revealing. All right. Yeah. Can you enlarge that so, you can, so people can see that? Because, see, no, take that off. Take the, take the, yeah. Because I want people to see, see, it's underlined. If you have a textbook, these two words are underlined in every book. Concealing and revealing. That's the key I want you to get here about the veils, the second department of veil. See, that's one of the principles of it. I told you it's, it, it's a point of transition, but also it's pointing out the concealing, the concealing and revealing. Okay? Now, come over here. Do this play. See his, 
See, it's ragged because it's torn, it's rent. See, but before it was concealed. This is you. This is you before you come in here. Before you come in here, come to some knowledge. See, before the Holy Spirit. Now, once the Holy Spirit has, has been rendered to you, that's a renting of the veil and also the flash of the Shekinah in your consciousness, okay? The concealing and revealing, okay? Now, let's read John 1 and, John 1, and 1. John 1 and 1. Uh -huh. In the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. and the Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Mm -hmm. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, see, now listen carefully. See, now this life was the light of men, meaning that this light is in everybody. Who has ever lived this is the light of men that is in everybody all eight billion folks that are on this planet now you know we could just make it present yeah, tense but even in, ever since the, the man Adam because this is where it started okay True. all right so this light is the light of men in every man but read and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now this light shineth in darkness, but because of the veils, you, we didn't comprehend it at all. But the light was dead, but we didn't comprehend That's it. Right. That's right. See, we had to come to class or someplace, you know, like class where the, where the gospel was preached and the veils is rent. Then all of a sudden, oh, I see for the first time. Well, you were seen before you came in here. That's right. <laughs> but now I see, you know, because now the veil is rent. And the flash of the Shekinah has happened. But prior to that, the veil was intact. Elohim is still sitting on the throne, but the veil is intact. Remember, your body, soul, spirit. Because as a veil, your soul could not see what was in the most holy place. But you can see what's on the veil, what's on the veil. Angels are on the veil. Particularly one angel that's brighter than most. Yeah. And let me tell you something. Oh, shoot. Bring it up here. <laughs> the fourth day. See, this is why I tell you. This is what Dr. Tr Kelly tried to show folks. See, you have to use these charts in place to make your doctrinal point. And, and because we see things visually, that's why he illustrated this stuff. All right? Now... In fact, let's just look at this. Here's the stars up here. All right. Read the fourth day. Go back to the textbook. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I do want to read that one part. Uh, volume 1, page 64. Volume 1, page 64. At the bottom of the page, as seen on the second veil. As seen on the second veil, plate 9B. Plate 9B, right here, see, go ahead. Among the many stars is shown one special planet, uh -huh. Saturn, surrounded by rings or halos, as the stars represent the angelic host created before the physical creation. Mm -hmm. Saturn, with its halos, represent Lucifer, the beautiful archangel who exalted himself above Yahweh because of the beauty and wisdom with which Yahweh Elohim had created him. The self-exalted dis disposition of Satan, which is incarnated in the present dispensational man of sin, and the like disp disposition of his host, also incarnated in the so-called ministers of righteousness, mm -hmm. forbidding their converts to read certain literature to attend certain meetings etc mm -hmm. are inoculated brainwashed and circ circumscribed or surrounded or hen hedged in in their own pagan doctrines or papalism as shown by the halo surrounding the planet Saturn 
Yahweh Elohim made two great lights, mm -hmm. the sun and the moon. See the moon right here. To give light upon the earth and set them in the firmament as shown in the holy place and most holy place. Mm -hmm. Plate 9C and 9A. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, mm -hmm. to rule the night, as seen in the vision of the creation by Moses. Okay, good enough. Uh, now, I want that read about the stars, the planet Saturn, and the moon. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, let's just look at it. Okay? See? You got the veils up. So, you don't see the sun. That's you right. see You see Saturn. And look, your body, soul, and spirit. Since you don't, oh, you see Saturn, but not only that, you see the moon too, because it's in the holy place. Right. The soul sees the moon, mm -hmm. or it sees the cardinal ordinances mm -hmm. that man comes oh, up with. Yeah. Yeah. See, oh, let's read that. Uh, Jeremiah 31, I think it's 34. I'm thinking. See, I'm bringing all this up so that you can understand what the soul is subject to. And, 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 and then hopefully, for time permit, I could springboard into what the soul will expect to Jer receive Jeremiah at death. Jeremiah 31 and 34. And yeah. they shall teach no more every man his neighbor uh -huh. and every man his brother, saying, Know ye Yahweh, for they shall all know me. For from the least of them unto the greatest of them, mm. saith Yahweh. All right, go ahead. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Mm -hmm. Thus saith Yahweh, which giveth the sun for a light by day, uh -huh. and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for the light by night, okay. which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. Mm, okay, good enough. See, the, the, the moon, the ordinances of the moon. So if you're still doing see, that's what the solar eclipse is about. That's coming up. See, the solar eclipse... A solar eclipse is nothing more than the moon blocking out the sun, the view of the sun. You're standing here, and the moon blocks the view of the sun. The moon is a type of the, of the law of cardinal ordinances. So therefore, if you're still doing cardinal ordinances, you are under an eclipse. You're in darkness. Mm -hmm. Even though the light is shining, but you're in darkness. Mm -hmm. The darkness that's comprehended it, it not. Mm -hmm. See? That's what, the solar, that's what a solar eclipse means, you know? See? The moon is blocking out your view of the sun, which is a type, the, the S-U-N, a type of the S-O-N. Okay, now, okay, where I want to go with this. Um, okay, I brought all that up. Body, soul, spirit. Here you are. Your veils is up. Elohim is sitting on your throne because the law of the spirit is operating your heartbeat. You're living. He's there, but right. you don't know it. Right. But see, but Yahweh allows Satan to do he, what he does because it's part of his purpose. And seeing you see you see that, that Saturn up there, you see a bright angel up there, and then not only that, you see the ordinances of the moon, you think the moon is a pretty good thing too. But see, you don't know because you're in darkness. And seeing the moon lights up the darkness, not totally, but it moves around in the dark. Mm -hmm. Oh, where's that? At? Mm -hmm. Psalms 90 and 4. And then, then I'll get to Erica's question. I had to say all of this to set it up so that you can understand, well, this is what, what is established. Psalms 90 and 4. Uh -huh. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, uh -huh. and as a watch in the night. Now, it's, it is yesterday as it is past, and it's as a watch in the night. Now, under the Hebrews, when, 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 when Yahshua comes in, there were four watches in the night. All right? And a thousand years is as one day. All right, so now if there's four watches in the night. Mm. Okay, four watches. Yeah, okay, four watches, four times 1,000. That would be 4,000 years from Adam to Yahshua. Darkness. Okay. They're in darkness. And what comes up at night? The moon and the stars. The stars will represent the prophets, and the moon will represent the law. So they had the law and the prophets until 2 Peter 1.19. See, and that's the way we were. We were in darkness 
subject to the, to, to the moon, the law of carnal ordinances. It didn't matter what religion you came out of because everybody's That's got right. their own set of carnal ordinances. But, but read. Yeah. Second Peter 1.19. Uh-huh. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, mm -hmm. whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. As, as unto, did we just read that? The light shining in, yeah. the, in darkness, but yep. the darkness comprehending it not? Yeah. Go ahead. Until the day dawn and the day star arise in your Until hearts. Until the day dawn or the day star, which is the flash of the Shekinah, arise in your heart. Mm -hmm. How is that going to happen? First, the gospel has to be preached to you. See, and the veils will have to be rent. See, and then the flash, and that and it's Yahshua, who is that flash of the Shekinah, he's going to have to appear in your consciousness. How does that happen? Through, the art, through knowledge. Through knowing and understanding. Dr. Kinley used to say this. I think you can confirm it, but he said when you begin to understand more, it gets brighter and brighter. Things get brighter and brighter because it's the sun or the S-O-N type, which the S-U-N is a type. It's growing stronger and stronger. And the, the natural sun, when it rises, all the stars, the, you don't even see the stars no yeah. more. Even the moon is diminished mm -hmm. because of the strength of the sun. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way in you. Okay? Now... The whole thing about it is this, because people will say this, will ask, where do you go when you die? My, my, my prompt answer is, you don't go anywhere, right. to be honest with you, because the thing is, if you are in Yahshua now, when you take off this mortal coil, you will still be in Yahshua. So where did you really go? You just made a transition out of the flesh, but, but you didn't make a transition out of Yahshua. Right. See, that's the point. See, now prior to uh, the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua, mankind, as we said, was 4,000 years of darkness, all right? And so when they died, see, I'm talking about they, when they died in the faith, it's like going to sleep. Because I always say this, death is a type of sleep, and sleep is a type of death. Let's just quickly get an example. I think it's 1 Samuel uh, what I'm looking for is the Witch of Endor. That's what I want. First Samuel uh, 28. Uh, start with 10 because I want to expedite this. First Samuel 28 and 10. Mm -hmm. And Saul swore to her by Yahweh, saying, As Yahweh liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Mm -hmm. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel. Mm -hmm. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Sam Sam Saul. Mm -hmm. And the king said unto her, be not afraid for what sawest thou. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw as it were Elohim ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me? Mm -hmm. to bring In other words, why hast thou disquieted me? In other words, why did you wake me up? Mm -hmm. Just be, just be please. Why, why, why did you wake me up? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know how you know some people. You know, like you, 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 yeah. you sleeping, you resting good. Because Samuel was, I mean, yeah, he was resting good in Yahshua. Right. But he had to wait, you know, for him to get his name called. But he was, but he was sleeping mm -hmm. in the faith. That's and so now he's now. So now. And so now he's now. Who has woke me up here? Yeah. Well, you know, because I know this is not the resurrection day. This is not Yahshua, so, and I know it ain't Yahshua, so who, who's waking me up here? Who, who wants me? You know, who has disquieted me? Yeah. Okay, but read. And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and Elohim is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then Samuel, then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing Yahweh is departed from <laughs> really? thee, and mm -hmm. is become thine enemy? And Yahweh hath done for himself as he spake by me. 
For Yahweh hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyest not the voice of Yahweh, nor executed his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath Yahweh done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, Yahweh will also deliver Israel mm -hmm. with thee into the hand of mm -hmm. the Philistines, mm -hmm. and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. In other words, you'll be sleeping with me. Yeah. <laughs> you'll be dead. Yeah. You'll be sleeping with me. Now, I don't know if you're going to get woke up at the end of the latter days or not, <laughs> but I do know that tomorrow you will be sleeping with me. <laughs> okay? Go ahead and finish that. Yahweh also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. All right, good enough. All right. So now, mm -hmm. when we read this about the, the medium, you know, and Saul told her, bring me, bring me up Samuel, she didn't have any problem at first. Because, see, I know how the game goes. Because I, be, I, I used to dabble in this a little bit, though I was never crooked. I always thought I was really doing something. But there are people who, you know, who will, you know, are crooked. And, there, and, and, and here's something else about demons here. See, see, look, we told you that your body, soul, and spirit, body, soul, and spirit. An incorporeal angel is on, the same, is on the same wavelength, draw a line, on the same wavelength as a living soul. A living soul is incorporeal. An angel is incorporeal. A living soul is made up of the nine attributes. An angel is made up of the nine attributes. Angels are greater in power and might simply because they're not in the flesh. Okay? So they operate on the same wavelength. And we told you that they have the ability to appear in visions. Mm -hmm. And if they can appear in visions, look, they can appear, you know, like in mediums, they would say, well, bring me up some dead relative or something like that. They can appear as your dead relative and would know the things that your dead relative would know because souls operate on the same wavelength see they're not stupid i mean lucifer is very well read i mean like when he was out in the wilderness with joshua in the wilderness of judea yeah. he quoted the bible to him but not only can he quote the bible but he can quote the Koran, the rig veda the upanishads e. E. Ching, confucius he can quote you <laughs> see that's why I tell people when they do stuff, you know, like seance stuff, I say, I would, I would let the buyer beware because you don't know who you're really dealing with. Because I used to believe, you know, back in the day when I was a teenager and I used to do hypnosis, that I would hypnotize people and I would have them go through what's called past life regression. And I would take them back in stages, you know, like, what could you remember when you were five years old? What do you remember when you was one year old? What do you remember when you were in the womb? You know, what do you remember beyond that? And then they come into this, well, I was so-and-so and this kind of, you know. And so, am I, and so and I used to believe it. I, boy, I used to be a serious believer in reincarnation, what they call the transmigration of souls. You know, you, you know, live before, you know, you come down. And, and it don't work like that. Because, see, for the simple reason that Yahweh is vast. He doesn't have to recycle spirit. Right. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he doesn't have to recycle. There's, there's plenty of spirit to go around. Okay, so now, so now this is before Yahshua Messiah's death as a resurrection. Those who died in the faith, like Samuel, they were sleeping, all right? And Yahweh preached to them while he was in the grave, while they were in the grave. When he resurrected Sunday morning, he called out all their names, okay? And they resurrected, and then now they're not subject to the second death, just like here on the day of Pentecost. We draw on the line, day of Pentecost. See, seven years later, the Gentiles. See, you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then you're not subject to the second death. Okay? So that's why we, we try to tell people to learn about as much as you can about Yahweh now in the flesh because it is a thing that will take you over in the ages to come. There are seven ages, all right? We're here in the fourth age, the present kingdom age. And we're getting ready to go into the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh. That's three ages to come. The analogy I always like to use is the same way with the Israelites. They petitioned Pharaoh to go on a three days journey. And they had, and the Yahweh gave them the, the Passover to eat. And they had to eat this lamb 
they had to eat it all. And if they couldn't eat it all, get your neighbor to help you eat. In other words, you know, have your, you know, your staff ready, your, your loins girding, and, you, and be full of lamb. Because you was going to go on a hard march for three days, but, you know, and you got to be full of that lamb. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, you, you weren't going to make it. It's the same difference over here. See, you got to be full of the lamb now because we're going on a three days journey. See? And, there's no, and, and nothing else is going to be given. You got to be full. That's why I tell people, you know, well, and people get dismissive too. And it pisses me off, I'll be honest, because they say, well, I don't need to learn all this now because we're going to be learning in ages to come. So why, why spend, why go through all this now? See, now that's the, <laughs> that's the fallacy right there because you don't know how much right. you need to know. That's why I say learners, Dr. Kinley said it best. He said, look, he said, read everything because you're going to need it. I used to think, you know, you know, he was talking about reading, you know, encyclopedias and books and stuff. No, he said, read everything. Read everything on this vision. Learn everything you can possibly know on this vision because you're going to need every molecule of it, especially in these last days because it's, even the scripture says that it's going to be so bad. Even, even the very elect, you know, could, could possibly be fooled by this. That's why we yep. tell you, learn all that you can, see? Yep. Now, what happens to the world? Let's see. Uh, let me get plate 38. I'll be almost finished because I, you know, I know it's Tuesday night and I, it's curfew night. <laughs> All right. Now, here. Here's Joshua appearing from heaven, all right? And he's coming through the veils, which is the human race. See, fire from above, and then here, fire from below, all right? And we appear with him in glory, all right? Now, prior to this, the whole human race, when they die, it's, it's similar to, to Samuel. They, they will be asleep, but all they know is what they know in the flesh. So just as what we say that when you die, where do you go? Well, you don't go anywhere. That applies to the carnal mind, too. If you're carnal, when you go, you ain't going nowhere either. You'll still be carnal. Mm -hmm. See, and, that, and really, I like to say it like this. If you die and you're carnal, then, the, then this, this universal revelation of Yahshua right here, this is the finish line for you. You're not going any further than you. It's like Monopoly. Do not pass go. Right. Do not collect $200. This is, this is it for you. Now, those in Yahshua are full of the Lamb. Their journey will continue. See? I'll use the example of my old man because he really didn't like this class. He thought I was crazy. He still, even before I got in the class, he thought more so when I got in the class. But my father liked to do things like uh, hunting, fishing. He liked to go bowling on Friday nights and stuff like that. So, and, and see, just take it from a natural standpoint. When you, when you naturally go to sleep, what do you usually do when you sleep? You dream. You dream about things that, you know, you did during the day. And really, dreams are productive in the sense that because, see, your physical body is an information magnet. You know, everything, you know, your five senses records everything. You may not consciously think of it, but it records all this information, even to the point of the wind blowing on the hairs on your head, on your arm or on your head. You may not think about it, but your brain your is registering it. So at night, it's got to, you know, process and compartmentalize all this information, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so likewise... When you dream, you know, and you dream, you know, dreams are awake. You know, the dead, when they sleep, they dream too. My father's dreaming about calling the dogs when he was hunting. Here, 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 here you know, um, you know, or bowling. Is that, that's because that's all he knew. Mm -hmm. He went to church, you know, you know, that's all he knew. But then when that last day come, when that last day come right here, when that last day come and Yahshua is, is appearing, see, then it'll be brought back to his remembrance and everybody else, those who are not in this body, that you did have an opportunity to be in that body. Right. And it will be made painfully clear that you, you know, when and how you rejected it. And, it, and it'll be too late at that point because you can't say, well, I, I didn't know, I didn't understand, can I get another chance? Nope. <laughs> see, that's the whole point. See, that's why you have to be in Yahshua now, see, and not later. See, you be, be translated in the spirit now, 
So that when you do take off the flesh, you really ain't going nowhere. You're still in Yahshua. See, forever. See. And in him, we will be in him. And at the end of the ages, we will, we will graduate. And we will truly understand at that point why Yahweh made of creation in the first place. Why he made the man. Why he, what is the total purpose? Is the things that happened in ages before and we'll know things that happened in ages to come because Yahweh is eternal. Okay? Did that answer your question? Okay? Good. I'm glad. All right? I, I, I kind of went through the long way, but I, I felt like I had to at least set up a decent foundation to address it. Because, see, I could just say, well, this is what happened. But unless you understand how this process comes about, now when you, get, when you hear the answer, it makes a lot more sense. Okay? All right. We're done. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for joining us. We hope that the things you heard was edifying as well as enlightened. And we invite you to come back and study with us again so that you, too, will be able to see this great, the great panoramic viewpoint. See, that simply means this. You're going to look at this the way Yahweh looks at it, and not a man, okay? As always, be safe, be healthy, but, <coughs> but be in Yahshua the Messiah. Why? Because he most truly, truly, truly is your only hope of glory. And with those few words, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All righty, that concludes tonight's class. Thank you all for joining us and come back again. We have Thursday night class, Zoom and everything else. Okay, uh, I'll, let's all stand be dismissed. I'll be quoting from the last couple of verses of Jude. Now unto, him, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you followers with his presence and his glory, with exceeding joy. The only true that, the only true out of him, Yahshua the Messiah. Oh boy. What was that? Let's all say. Let's all say. Hallelujah. <laughs>